No, we just, we have to stop and think about every time that we do this, just exactly what this has done before. Just like the song said, you know what, we remember him. And that's what we do every time we partake in communion. We remember what he did, his broken body, his shed blood for each and every single one of us. You know what, and just keep in mind that this bread is his body, which was broken on the cross for you. And it's from that which manifests in him. And this wine or grape juice, whichever we may use, is representative of his shed blood for each and every single one of us, which comes from the forgiveness of sins. And the gospel tells us, for I received from the Lord that which, we, uh, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, hey, he, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant cup in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. We just pray everybody. Father, we just we love you. We know what we do here when we just receive communion. That that broken body on that cross, and just your son, just exposed for the world to see, Father, was for our healing, for our salvation, for the restoration of just every infirmity that could possibly come against you, Father. It's broken in his name. Father, we thank you for the shed blood, which was our salvation, Father. He gave it willingly. He gave up his life, his blood spilled for us, Father. And we thank you for these things. I pray blessings and mercy, love, peace, protection over each and every single one here this morning, Father. That they just they just ask you for this healing. And they know, they don't have to ask it, Father, but they know that they will receive it in their faith, Father. You know, your Bible, your, your word tells us that according to your faith, let it be done to you. I pray that each one is ignited, Father, that their faith just overruns every single thing in their being, Father, that you just be made primary in their lives and that you restore all things in those bodies, Father. Let us always be thankful to you and we love you. We honor and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So, I don't know if Pastor Nikki had any announcements for this morning. I think we're, you didn't have any? All right. Uh, the only thing that I know about that's going on is July 12th, the fire department is going to be having movie night in the park over here. So um, they're going to be doing ice cream. And I think somebody said something about pretzels or something on the stall pretzels. I don't know. But at any rate, if anybody wanted to help out, volunteer, or come and watch the movie or whatever, that um, I can get more details um, if you need them. Just see me and I'll shoot you a text or send you a message. Um, but I know that they're doing that. And since we love our fire department, we're going to support them whenever we can, right? Amen. So last week I talked about, you know, the, uh, the true freedom of Independence Day. And since we're still celebrating this weekend, I figured I would wrap up with the, with the same, you know, message, continuing on a little bit. But since we're wrapping this up, you know, I wanted to end it by speaking just a little bit more about what the Founding Fathers did and their faith that they had. The faith that they had in God the Father, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was what made that resolve possible in order to form this nation. We too should embrace these same things, not only for our own salvation, but for the sake of the salvation of countless others that the freedom of this nation provides. Think about that for a minute. You know, people always complain that the United States is the policeman of the world, right? We get tagged that way. The other countries sometimes look at us like, oh, you're telling us what to do. But you know what? Without us having done that, look what we did in World War II. Freed a continent, okay? But why did we do that? You know what? That place was a dark place. We fought an enemy who believed in the occult and would tear down the people of God, amen? So this, these things, this is what we were here for. Look back over time and think about everything that has been done by this nation, our troops and whatnot. Guys, the primary thing that we have to do is the Great Commission. It's the propitiation of the gospel, 
Get it out there. Get it heard. Get people saved. But without this blanket of freedom for people to be able to do that, which the United States provides and has provided from that day until this, that, this day present, it's done just for the glory of God, right? So, as I said last week, the United States is the last bastion of Christianity that this world will ever know. I believe that. And I can say that because I believe that we are in the end times. All we have to do is just take a look around and know that the prophecy in the Bible is being fulfilled. Chris and I were just messaging back and forth yesterday about what's going on in California. You know, with as whacked out as that place is, you know what I was telling Chris? I'm like, I believe that's the barometer right there. You want Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. I, call, it's, I find it no shock that the earthquakes <laughs> start there and that they, they've always been there. You know, I don't want to take anybody down, I don't want to tear people down, but this thought process, a lot of this stuff comes out of Hollywood, guys. The hypocrites, what did Jesus walk around telling the Sadducees and the Pharisees? You hypocrites, right? Oh, I don't like guns. What do they do? They're making movies. <coughs> guns everywhere, right? I don't like guns, though. Then why are you taking our money making movies that have guns, right? Hypocrisy, guys. All hypocrisy. Well, let's start this morning with the title of this message. I told you last week that John Adams and John Hancock said on April 18th, 1775, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. Meaning no one, no entity can be put above God. That's why I have the belief that I, I do about the authority that's found in the Bible. It's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about his Holy Spirit. Nothing is put above them, much less any type of government entity, right? But this is what the founding fathers knew. And they said, of course, because of the times, they were fighting a tyrannical king. And they said, and there is no king but Jesus who is the king of kings, amen? But they got this from God's word. They knew his word, they stood on his word, and it was something that they could all agree on. If you notice, none of those founding fathers were atheists. You know what? They, try, they, they may try to mar history and tell you that there were, that Thomas Jefferson was some kind of heretic and didn't believe in God. It's not true. He just had a little bit different outlook on it, all right? But he was not an atheist. These guys were not atheists. They all knew that they had a creator, and they all knew that it was God Almighty. They may have believed a little bit differently from each other, just as we do. We have the Presbyterians, we have Baptists, we have Methodists, we have the Evangelicals, but we're all part of a Protestant movement, right? Now, has anybody ever really stopped and thought about that? Martin Luther set forth this Protestant Reformation, right? But when that happened, people said, Oh, but yeah, I, I don't know about that. Well, I'm going to believe this, but it's really God's word, but we're not going to do that. All right, That's how this happened, where you have Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, all these different things, right? Protestant Reformation, Catholicism, Christianity. That's what we're talking about here. And you know what? There was, I think there was only one Catholic that actually signed the Declaration. This was a nation that was leaving that thought process, amen? And they did. The Bible says in Isaiah 44, 6, this is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. It also says in Isaiah 45, 5, I am the Lord and there is no God. Other. It doesn't say right there, no other God. He gets to that. He says, I am the Lord. I am your Lord. Apart from me, there is no other. Anything that you put above him, again, we heard this years ago, to put forth something higher than God, to make something a priority in your life more than God is sinful. All right? I know that's harsh, but that's really what this boils down to. And then he goes on to say, apart from me, there is no God. But you know what? In regard to Jesus being king, Pilate asked our Lord if he was the king of the Jews. And Jesus said, 
It is as you said. And that's found in Luke 23, 3. But you know what? I was reading over this again this morning. And I'm going to hit on this a little bit later. But I seem to remember in the Bible that God said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Well, if Jesus said that he's the king, I guess we should believe him, right? God said it, so we believe it. But many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had this firm conviction, and it was that there was one God, and Jesus was the only true king. But for these great men to do what they did, there could be absolutely zero doubt in their hearts. There could be no shame in uttering those words, right? I was actually writing this yesterday, and I said, you know what, there could be no shame in their game, amen? And just, there was no shame in them. You know, when, they, when these two stood up on April 18th, 1775, and said this, there could be no shame in them, because they were speaking to the people. Their resolve had to convince and sway these people that what they were doing was right, even though this was seen as rebellion. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, you hear it being said now in churches all over the place about how we should just, oh, well, you know, the rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Right, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm sure it was said then. I'm sure that the English said that. Rebellion to your king is considered the sin of witchcraft. I don't know how much, how much history you guys know, but the English believed that the king was ordained by God to rule over them, regardless of how tyrannical he may be. They believed that until these guys showed up and said, no, that's not what the Bible says. We're going to go by what the Bible says, right? And again, Acts 5.29, we should obey God and not men. And that's what these guys did. But you see, there really is no room for anything in our lives that somehow doesn't bring glory to God. I've told you guys this in the past. When you do anything, you have to stop and think, am I bringing glory to God in what I'm doing here? Am I tearing someone down or am I lifting someone up? How is God going to be glorified in what I'm doing? You know, what was it? Uh, Martin Luther King, I believe, was the one that said, if you're going to be a street sweeper, be the best darn street sweeper that you can be. You know what? Sing a hymn. Sing a praise and worship song while you're, you're shoving that room around, right? This is how this happens. Amen? But where did they get this ability to not be ashamed? Again, they knew their Bible. They knew what the Bible says in Romans 1, 16 and 17. We've all heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. Listen to that. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for to the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed, faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that's where I'm going with this message this morning. You know, when Paul wrote to the Romans, he talked about whenever the gospel was being preached, they spoke of the faith of the Roman churches and how this was being reported. The apostle prayed constantly for them, just as we have to pray constantly for those whom the Lord lays upon our hearts. I hope everybody has a prayer list. You know what? Some lists are longer than others. But if you tell someone you're going to pray for them, you better do it. You better be doing it. Paul also prayed that he might see those Roman believers. He longed to share with them a spiritual gift. And he actually corrected himself in Romans 1.12. And he said, to share the blessings of Christ in mutual fellowship together. Although Paul had not planted the church in Rome, yet he longed to have fruit there to reap that harvest among them. But well, let's go back for a second, right? To share the blessings of Christ in mutual fellowship together. Is that not what the founding fathers did? They all believed. This was ordained by God, guys. That's what this was all about. They talk about, oh, well, how come the founding fathers didn't foresee this and foresee that? Because they had nothing but God on their minds. These guys believed they had the foresight to do what God was telling them to do. Anything outside of that, what I just said, simple, 
right? So they're not going to talk about the sinful nature of man and what they're doing. They just knew that you shouldn't be doing it. And you know what? Things happen the way they do for a reason. God, like I said, God's in control. I get it. The enemy's in control of this earth. But it had to play out. Otherwise, prophecy wouldn't be able to be fulfilled. God knew what was going to happen. Amen? But there are incentives to sharing the gospel with others. And that's what the Founding Fathers allowed us to do. And you know what? Number one, it is a debt. Romans 1.14 says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. As the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul pronounced his indebtedness to people from all walks of life. To every level of education. Okay? It didn't matter if you were a farmer out there picking potatoes or whatever. I don't know. I think they can never handle whatever. Right? Out there doing your potato thing. Out there doing your cabbage thing, right? You're sweaty and stinky, dragging the cow in, right? He's pooping on you and doing whatever. You're stinky, okay? It doesn't matter. But these guys were all farmers. These guys were all statesmen. They served a multi-plethora of roles for this nation, right? But we've been entrusted with this gospel, not to keep it to ourselves, but to share it with others, to share it with everyone. And that's what these guys did. They knew that there was a need, and they knew that it had to be done. But Paul was so eager to discharge his debt that he felt ready to preach in Rome. I don't know how many people know anything about Rome, but Rome wasn't the place you wanted to be if you were a Christian. Woo, baby. They would light you up. And actually, it was in Europe. Took Christians and used them as candles. He would set them on fire so he could see his garden at night. So that's not the place you want to be burned around for about Jesus. But Paul wanted to go there and let them know about it. Number two, this is something which we need not be ashamed of. I just said, for Romans 1.16, so I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. The fact is that the gospel raises the contempt and scorn of all sorts of people. I've been telling you guys for weeks now, you talk about God when you're going to think, hey, brother, you yeah, God's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, hey, easy. I don't want to talk about that. Yeah, we do. All right? And I'm done. I told you, Nikki and I were talking atheists two weeks ago. I didn't even realize they were atheists. I'm talking about Jesus, amen, in it. And they were kind of like, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, on, you go. Whatever. You know what? You heard about Jesus. Get over it. But Paul speaks of the preaching of the cross as foolishness in 1 Corinthians 1.18. You hear what I'm saying, though? He was talking about the way that they pursued it. And the preaching of Christ crucified is a stumbling block to some and foolishness to others. Yet despite the adverse reactions, which we're going to get, guys, we're going to receive them, we are not to be ashamed of the gospel nor the sharing of our faith with others. Like I said, calling you here. Okay. Guess what? You heard the name of Jesus. Get over it. You may be hurt by it and you may go home and cry a little bit, but you know what? Like I said, there are no atheists in foxholes. And when the... Uh, what? Oh, how do you say that? You know, like so people say, when the, you know what hits the fan when the defecation hits the rotary oscillator, you're going to be crying out for Jesus, trust and believe. Because you know what? Your spirit man comes out and you can't help it. This obeys. All right? And you're like, Jesus, help me because I can't do this. Amen? That's the stuff I'm talking about. But this is what 1 Corinthians 18 to 23 says For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Right? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews it is stumbling block, and to the Greeks it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, 
the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. How often does the Bible talk about when they ask Jesus some stupid question, thinking they're going to they were going to pin him down, and Jesus tells them something? They're like, I guess we should play him up and not have that guy in our question. The wisdom of God, because you know what? How many times have we heard, "Oh, I need the meat of the word." Yeah, and you choked at that moment because you just can't understand that, right? Spoon fed at first. Okay? What do we do with little babies? We spoon feed them, right? And then as they grow, they chew on stuff like that. You guys, I'm not saying anyway in the group, but just saying people would want, oh yeah, they want fire and brimstone. But then when you talk, my mom was one of them. I love my mom dearly, but she was one of them. Mom, the Bible says this. Yeah, yeah, amen. And then it says this. Oh yeah, well, I don't know. Not that far. <laughs> What? You can't pick and choose, right? And this woman was in her Bible her whole life, but she would do that, you know, right up until she got sick, and then kind of, you know, tamed her a little bit. But number three, this is the power of God to salvation. This is the part of the reason that we need not be ashamed. We share our testimony to God's goodness in our lives. We're not proclaiming of ourselves, but we're talking about what God has done for each and every single one of us. That's your testimony. You guys should have not just one testimony. Miss Carolyn, yours was fabulous. You were the last one that did it for the other day. It was great. But you have to have multiple ones, right? Because you don't know if somebody's hurting. Like you said, that woman came to you, right? And you were talking to her. I don't know where she didn't even know you. But you know what? You're witnessing God's goodness. God's glory, God's mercy, God's peace, love upon your life. And these people see that and they say, I don't know what you got, but I want it. Okay? Not a bad way. They want Jesus. You have to have multiple testimonies. When we preach the results, they do not lie, right? We don't talk about what we do with our own hands, but what God does through our hands. So we need not to worry. One may plan, another may warn, but the word tells us it is God that provides the increase. Amen? And that can be found in 1 Corinthians 3 6. But what an increase that he provides. The gospel said, says it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. And that word salvation presupposes the need for deliverance. Everyone has the need to be delivered from sin and its consequences, and that's emphasized in Romans 1, um, 18 and 3, and, uh, 3, 20. The gospel is the message of this power of God to accomplish the salvation in those who believe. John 1, 12 tells us that as many as have received Jesus, to them he gave power. And that word power there is the Greek word Dunamis, which from which we have the English word, get a load of this, dynamite, and dynamic, to become sons of God, and even to them that believe on his name. John 3.16 is also referred to as whosoever believes. So while the power is transmitted through those preaching, the instrument for tapping into that power is faith. You know, we always hear about John 3.16, right? You know, people always get that first part. But listen to what it really says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, what? Believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The key there is who believes in him. It's that Simple. That's why we say the prayer, the salvation prayer, at the end of every service. It is that simple. I say, I believe it, I receive it, and that's it. Now, you can't go and do your thing after that and sin every five seconds. That's not going to kind of work. But when you do it, you believe it, and you receive it, that's all it takes. Paul emphasizes the historical priority of the Jews in this preaching of the gospel. Theirs was the adoption the glory and the covenant, the giving of the law, the service of God and their promises. Theirs were the fathers, but through those fathers came Christ in the flesh. That's the part where they stop. They just don't receive the Messiah. 
There's still a ceremonial holding pattern suspended, waiting for Messiah to return. You know, and that brings something to my mind. I, I think I might have told you guys this, but I was watching a documentary on uh, the last month or the month before, and they were talking about how the Jews, when you stop and think about what they're looking for in Messiah, it lines up to what the Antichrist is going to provide when he gets here. And a rabbi was the one that was talking about it. Oh, yeah, guys. This is why the earth will be so deceived when he says that even God's elect will be deceived. Because he comes as a warrior. He's going to set things right. And they're like, oh boy, this has got to be Messiah. Because Jesus came as a lamb saying, eh, well, you guys wonder, you're a hypocrite, whatever. Whatever. You know, you can tell me I'll rebuild this temple in three days. It wasn't the guy that was coming around, right? Taking charge and kicking tail. But yet, to a believer, we know that what that, that's exactly what Jesus did. I say it all the time. The people, I love them. Some people are like, hey, and they're all cheery. I don't know. Why Jesus ran into the temple, flipped tables over, and started screaming and yelling, carrying on, saying, what are you doing? You're turning this temple into a den of thieves, right? My father's house. We know him as a warrior. He just did it a little bit different. But number four... This reveals God's righteousness. Paul further refuses to be bullied into not preaching this gospel, but it reveals the righteousness of God. It reveals God as the righteous judge who will do everything right. The rhetorical question posed by Abraham was, shall not the judge of the earth do right? That's in Genesis 18.25. It also reveals God as the one who is both just, meaning righteous, and he is the justifier of all who come to him through Christ Jesus. The gospel clothes us in Christ's righteousness, an altogether righteous God, in the one who dies for the unrighteous. I know that's kind of hard to take out, saying righteous 52,000 times, right? Basically says, Jesus died for every one of us sinners so that we would get to heaven, amen? Our faith arises from an act of God in history in which he sent forth his only begotten son to die for the sins of the people. And our faith grows from faith to faith, from Jew to Gentile. You know, you may as well say for us, from Jew to Gentile to Catholic, because they believe that they were the one true church. And through the Protestant Reformation, we got the Bible for us to read, for us to know what the true word of God says. Amen. Faith grows extensively through the collective work of evangelism, right? We're evangelicals. We get that label. Why? Because we're crazy. We're around telling everybody about Jesus. That's what's awesome, right? Woohoo! Jesus, yeah! Right? That's what you're supposed to be doing, okay? Evangelism. But it's by that faith from first to last that God's righteousness is revealed. Philippians 1, 5, and 6 says, and I want you to catch this. This is where this is really going today. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about what I'm talking about today, this nation, the founding fathers. Listen to it again. For your fellowship in the gospel, for that fellowship that the, that the signers and the writers of the text of the Constitution, right? That fellowship that they had in God and the gospel from that first day until now. The Bible's forever. So until now, tomorrow is going to be tomorrow. Next week, when you read it, it's going to be next week. So until now, be confident of this very thing, that he, that God, who began this good work, what these guys were doing, that good work that they did, so that the gospel could go forth in a dark world, right? This work that was begun in you will complete it, will continue to complete this mission, this great commission, until Jesus returns. I don't know about you, but I never looked at that like that until I started putting this together. And you see, guys, when you read the Bible, there's just, there's just so many levels of what this stuff means. 
And when you put it into context, you're like, I, I never saw that. But they knew that. They were on a mission. And God was using these men to complete his work. To complete his work daily. Daily. But I'm going to stop right there. I told you all that the United States is the last bastion of Christianity that this world will ever know. God influenced our founding fathers with his word, with the faith in Jesus, and the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They all believed in one way or another. But notice what it says there in Philippians 1.5. It continues in verse 6. Think about what I just said and how that translates to what they were doing. It makes perfect sense. They all had fellowship in the gospel as they all believed. It would be from that first day until Jesus returned. They all had confidence in his word that Jesus, who had begun this work in them, would continue to work towards this completion of his great commission through them and now us and our children, our children's children, should the Lord Carry, amen, until it's done. Until it's done. The Bible tells us every nation has to hear the gospel. When that happens, that's it. I believe that there's a number. In Revelation, it talks about this number for the martyrs to be equal with those brethren, right? I believe it's a trigger. They never say what that number is, but that's it. When that number clicks, that's it. Jesus is coming. And there's no stopping them, right? Like I said, right now, up until that day when he comes back for us. But do you guys see how important this was, this founding of this nation, to go forward to do this in the world? Take the United, I want you to stop and think about this. You take the United States out of this equation right now, where's the world left? <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Because I'm going to tell you right now, every nation in the world is going to attempt to run over Israel. They would love it. The UN, that useless organization, they'd be like, oh yeah, Israel's terrible. Yeah, let's take everything from them. Let's take the resources. Let's put them into concentration camps. Let's do all this stuff. You know what? I have two words for you. But God. Yeah. If you guys have never looked up what happened during the Six-Day War when these guys thought that they were going to overrun Israel, <laughs> yeah. whoa, and it wasn't even Israelis that were giving the accounts. It was the fighters that were opposing them. Syrian jets in the air. They were giving testimony that they saw a hand come out of the sky and swat them like they were gnats. They couldn't get near them. The Israeli troops outnumbered like 10 to 1 or something from Egypt. Egypt I think it was Egypt that was coming in from the south, right? What the Egyptians saw were angels and chariots of fire behind the Israeli forces as they were coming at them. Do you think the Israelis knew they were there? No. But you know what they did? They ran in fear, left their own artillery emplacements in place. The Jews came, turned them around, and started using their own equipment to fire on them and kill and destroy them. That's how I got rolled. That's the Jesus I know. Right? They are his protected people. Okay? But the United States keeps this all in line so that the gospel can continue to go forward. Our founding fathers knew that through the guidance and wisdom of God, they fashioned a grand constitutional republic through which all men and women were free. Truly amazing, though, isn't it? Now that you're seeing how all of this was done. We've all heard that the Bible was written by men, but inspired by God. And I'm not placing the Declaration of the Constitution up there with the Bible, but I'm telling you right now, it was written by men, but it was inspired by God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. They wouldn't talk about the Creator. They wouldn't have even mentioned it. But they did. It's there for a reason. You see, God has his hand on this nation, and we are a shining city on the hill. We are the light that is placed out for all to see. And it's so that that glorious light of his gospel could be preached to all the nations. The formation of this nation was and is so important to God's plan 
But I believe, though, that as we move closer and closer to the end point, the city on the hill will begin to lose its luster, right? We will lose our ability to shine. Why? The Bible is very clear that in those times, in those last days, Israel will stand by themselves. And like I said, just as in the Six Day War, I say by themselves, meaning nations won't help them. They don't need it. Like I said, two words, but God. God said it, they will never die out. This is the way it is. We already know about the 144,000. It's going to go back. But you know what? God protects them so his people won't die out. Israel does not need mortal allies. God will be with them. The Bible says in Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people that he has chosen for his own inheritance. I just referenced that verse found in Psalm 33, but our founding fathers knew their Bible. And I'm going to read this entire psalm so that you can fully understand why John Adam, or uh, uh, Sam Adams and John Hancock said, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. Listen to this. It actually says here in Psalm 33, the sovereignty of the Lord in creation and history. Are you catching this? Nobody could, unless you put this into perspective, you don't pick up on this stuff. But what is he saying here? Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. What's the United States talk about all the time? Justice is the American way, amen? The earth is full of goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by all the host of them, the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up in deep, or lays up the deep in storehouses. Get a load of this. Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the what? Nations to nothing. He makes the plans of those people no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually, and he considers all their works. Meaning nations, he's already, he said, blessed is the nation whose God is in the right. That's what he's talking about. But then he reduces it to, if there's a kid in China who received Jesus, even though that regime tells him no, is he saved? Yeah, he's saved because why? God is sovereign. There is nothing aside from him, right? But then it goes on to say, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Translate that today. Nations, presidents, these people will not be saved by their armies. Amen? A mighty man is not delivered through his own strength. And a horse, look at that, back then a horse, but now a tank, a fighter jet, a bomber, is a vain hope for safety. Why? Because God is sovereign. All right, it will not deliver any by their own strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. 
Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in Him, because we have trusted in His holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. You catching this? Right? The psalm is reflective of their words that there is no sovereign but God, and no king but Jesus. They were not ashamed that we shouldn't be either. While the psalm is Old Testament, it is God's word. The gospel is the good news, the salvation that Jesus bought for us, which was paid for in full by his blood. We all like good news, and we welcome messengers with happy words. The Old Testament prophesies how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. That's found in Isaiah 52, 7. But the Apostle Paul had such a message. It was a demonstration of God's righteousness. It was an announcement of salvation for those who had offended God. Catch what Romans. Remember what, how Romans starts out. He's talking about all the abominations, right, that they were doing. But it was a message of good news. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the apostle was not ashamed because the message of the gospel is infused with the power of God's word, right? And in the beginning, God just spoke a word and all things were created. Through the gospel, God also speaks the word. And in it, it carries within it the power to save all those who believe its message. It demonstrates that quality of God, which we call righteousness. It shows his activity in putting right the wrong that relationships had created prior to that, which existed between God and a sinful man. Above all, the gospel teaches us how the believer is made righteous with the righteousness of Christ. Not us. Guys, we don't deserve it. We don't. We don't deserve it. But they, I say they, Jesus loved us so much because the Father loved us so much that they sent the Holy Spirit to live and dwell in us so that we could be guided accordingly to find them. Paul says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what I was just talking about. God's anger is not like man's anger. We're prone to sudden changes of mood. God's anger is a righteous anger based in his holiness. God's anger is directed against all kinds of evil. I always say this. I don't know if I've ever said it from this pulpit, but I'm going to tell you right now. People that say, God's not in the rap business anymore. Lie. Don't believe it. God the Father. The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, if he was in the wrath business before, it means he's in the wrath business now, and he's going to be in the wrath business in the future. The difference is that he sees us through the eyes of Jesus. And Jesus says, God, I got this. I died for them. Let me take care of this. Okay? And God the Father respects the Son. What did I say? Hear him. The Father hears him. Right? So this is how this goes down, guys. So be careful when you hear somebody say that. But another prophet said, You are purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wicked. And that's Habakkuk 113. We all know that there is a God because we're constantly surrounded by his creation. In the heavens declare the glory of God. And that was King David in Psalm 19. When I say we all know that there is a God, I mean it. We all sense it in our spirits. We know that he's there. Our founding fathers knew that as well. It was what bound them all together and made them all be able to compromise I want you to understand the different belief systems that they all came from. This is where, when they talk about Thomas Jefferson being different, he was. Thomas Jefferson was totally different in how he saw things and what he wanted for this nation. But because he believed, they were all able to come together to compromise with their own way of what God told them how this nation should be formed. Think about that. How often do you sit at the table at Thanksgiving, right? And you got people from different political parties, and they're all yelling and screaming across the table. 
That's what was going on in that room. But you know what? God prevailed. He brought them all together, right? The Bible says, in heaven the created being cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's Isaiah 6, 3. Yet nowadays it seems more and more like man seeks to live without acknowledging the only true God. Man suppresses the truth of God and exchanges that truth for a lie. That's what Romans talks about. Instead of worshiping the Creator, man makes idols represented created things and worships them. Those who do such things, teaches Paul, are without excuse. God's present judgment against mankind is seen and is turning them over to all kinds of lusts and perversion. What do you see in the world? What do you see in the world? I can remember my parents talking about when TV first came out. And you know, I remember watching I Love Lucy. Remember? I, Ricky and Lucy never slept in the same bed. Lucy always had that robe. Remember her robe, her house coat? It was all buttoned to the top. Yes, Ricky, what would you like for breakfast? If there was a bedroom seat, they were never laying in bed. Do you guys remember what TV show got nailed because it showed mom and dad in bed for the first time? You don't know? The Brady Bunch. Remember the scene when the kids come in and there's mom and dad? Woo, that was scandalous. And that was in the 70s. Okay? But what do we see now? What do we see now on TV? Oh, you got these 21, 22 year old chickadees with that fall right up their hiney. You wonder why the world is the way that it is. That's just one thing, right? What did we just see this past month? Holy cow. John Cena. You love John Cena. The vodka commercials that are out there. Oh, there's a subliminal message in there, baby. <laughs> if you did that in the 1950s on TV, I guarantee you that the FBI, the CIA, whatever other secret government agency would have ran in your house, kicked the door down, smashed your TV, and you never would have been heard from again. I guarantee it. Now what happens? They kick your door in and say, why aren't you watching Channel 12 that's got that on there? What happened, guys? Right? <laughs> Over these years, 60-something years, almost 70 years, the little noise, the chipping away at values, family values. I love that show, Married with Children. You guys remember that? Al Bundy, right? But what did they do to that guy? Every chance they got, the mother, the wife, tore him down. Tell him, you don't make enough money. You're a terrible father. You're a crappy shoe salesman. Right? So what do they do? They form no man. Remember all the guys in the neighborhood get together and form no man? Yeah. That just they don't like women, they don't like their wives? Could you possibly tear down the family unit anymore? But you know what? When you're watching it, you don't think of it like that, right? Nikki and I were just watching, we, we love, well, we got rid of her TV now, but we have Hulu now, but we used to watch MTV Classic. Now, for those of us that are my age or older, you can remember, right? At my age, we lived on MTV, right? You got home from school, you're doing your homework, you turn it on, and they're playing videos, and it was nonstop music videos, and you were like, yes! Right? Now when you turn it on, no music. Um, no music, <laughs> so why do they still call it music television beyond me? But there's a commercial, Nikki and I were watching it, and the guy, you guys might remember it, those that are our age, when the guy's driving and there's a little old lady in the back seat, he's like, yeah, I love the MTV. It's just awesome, you know what I'm saying? You know, and the old lady's like, mm. right? And he goes, you know why? Because you don't have to think. Because they tell you what to think. They tell you what to think, and you don't even have to think for yourself. That's what makes it so awesome. And I said, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> How did I get to be here having heard that? Because a generation, my generation, heard that and began to believe it. Right? But in my case, I have two words for God. Amen? But it's that chipping away, guys. That's what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but you have to get right with God somehow. 
in this world, right? You come to church. You listen to the word of God, okay? How do we do that? Like I just said, you come here. You hear the word. But we can do that because we live in the greatest nation that was ever created in this world. I do say that knowing that Israel is the land that God provided for them. But we were founded on the principles of Christianity. Big difference. Okay? Matthew 3.17 says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we know that God looks very highly upon his Son. We should probably pay attention to those red letters, like the song we sang in praise and worship, right? Those red letters. Luke 9.35 says, And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Okay, well we know it's important. Now God tells us we need to hear him. We heard before that Pilate questioned him about being the king. And he said, It is as you say. So now, I'm hearing him. I know that he's the king of kings. Amen? The Father told us to hear him. I know that Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, because I'm paying attention and I'm hearing him. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What did Philippians say, right? From now until Jesus returns. What did he just say again, right? Now, mind you, this is the gospel. Philippians wasn't one of the four gospels. That was Paul talking, right? But what does this say? Jesus says, go. Make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them. Teach them all things that I've heard that I've commanded you. And I am with you always, even till the end of the age. That means until he returns. But Jesus, we just heard him say that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And our founding fathers knew it, and they framed this nation on it. So it looks like our founding fathers knew what they were doing after all. Amen? Amen. All right, let's say our salvation prayer. Everybody repeat after me. My dear God in heaven, My dear God in heaven, God in heaven I believe today, I believe today that, Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is the Son of God. I believe, I believe that he died on the cross. That he died on the cross. That he rose on the third day. That he rose on the third day. And sits at your right hand. And sits at your right hand. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And thank you for receiving me today. And thank you for receiving me today. Into your kingdom. Into your kingdom. And for giving me of all my sins. And for giving me of all my sins. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And this is the ties and offering portion of our service. You guys know how we do it here. The basket's over on the side. And I'm telling you, you do what God tells you to do, what he puts on your heart. Because the Bible tells us God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't like it to be done grudgingly or sparingly. So you do what he tells you to do. But I want to give you your blessing as always. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the, increase the fruits of your righteousness. Well, you're in right and everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of his service not only supplied to the needs of the saints, but also as a boundary for many thanksgivings to God. Well, through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thank ye to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. 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 We can pray with you guys, and we'll have some fellowship.
Father, thank you for this service. Thank you for these people in attendance. Father, thank you for those that are watching. I pray blessings and love, mercy, protection, and peace over every single one of them. As they go out this week, Father, and face this world, face this nation, Father, just let them be a witness. Be the light, Father. Pull the cover off of them. Let them be that shining city on the hill. Let them be that lamp that's exposed on the lampstand, Father, that they be seen, your word be heard, and that we can talk about your son, Jesus. Not let us end with God, Father. Just let us end with Jesus. Talk about that. Get that name out there, Father, for we know that there's power in that, Father. You know, a lot of my prayers begin with the whole thing of that. He, having been made master of all that he surveyed, so too has been made master of our lives. And Father, there's power in that name, there's power in that faith, and I just proclaim it over each and every one of us this week, Father. We love you, we honor and praise you.